Hello, good evening. My name is Stefano Fanti. It's my pleasure to be here and to spend with you the next hour for this URO webinar, which has been organized by the European School of Urology. Um, I'm a nuclear medicine physician based in Bologna, and I will try to discuss uh, PET-CT in prostate cancer evaluation in the next hour. Uh, the structure of the webinar is based on my lecture that will essentially last um, around 35 minutes. Uh, and then we will have time to make questions to me. Uh, you can use the tool of the webinar in order to make the question and uh, I will do my best trying to address the question. So, ready to go. And uh, well, these are my disclosure. As I anticipated to you, the main disclosure is that I'm a nuclear medicine physician. Therefore, I'm very much motivated to promote PET-CT. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the field where I've been working in the last uh, 20 years. So when it, when it comes to imaging of prostate cancer, you can consider by essentially two different points of view. One is the imager point of view that is going to talk about methods. Uh, and the other is probably the clinician's point of view, which is mostly interested in using um, a different clinical need. So I, I will try starting with uh, uh, the imager perspective and uh, telling you which are the methods available and especially the, the PET-CT tracer which are available. And then we'll try to put it all in a clinical perspective. Uh, of course, there's not only PET-CT around the imaging of prostate cancer. We have uh, many different tools. Uh, including some tools that we may consider as um, very much standardized and used, but a little bit obsolete, like CT and bone scanning. Uh, transrectal ultrasound is also useful, uh, but it's very clear that in the last decade, uh, imaging has progressed a lot. There's a lot of innovation, especially in the field of MRI and PET-CT. And MRI, as everybody knows, is done by a radiologist, and nuclear medicine physicians are doing PET. Uh, in, in the large part of the world. Uh, PET indeed itself uh, is just an acronym indicating uh, a method, but uh, you have to specify which tracer you're using. And uh, here on the right, you can see uh, the many different uh, radio tracer or radio pharmaceutical that you may use uh, to study prostate cancer, or at least that have been proposed to study prostate cancer. Uh, I will go rapidly through them, giving you uh, my, let's say, my point of view, my impression, my opinion, which is based on the fact that I've been working with uh, almost all of them. And I will do also my best to try to convince you, uh, especially if you're a clinician, that, that PET tracer could be something like smartphone. So every year you can have a new one and you can be forced to move to a new one just because there's sort of a it's trendy or a, an innovation that you have to go through that but at the same time there's also some very good point in having good application um, and new uh, possibilities uh, given by using innovative and new radio tracer um, well, the first tracer I'm going to talk about is uh, FDG, so the fluoridesoxy glucose, uh, which is very widely used in oncology. Uh, in the majority of um, the solid tumor, it can be usefully applied, uh, but not in prostate cancer. In fact, it's very well known that FDG has a very poor sensitivity uh, for imaging prostate cancer, and essentially, there's no clinical use for FDG right now. Uh, here is an example and uh, uh, a paper. This is a, um, a gentleman that has already been uh, treated radically with, uh, with therapy, but there is a recurrency, as you can see, PSA high, but uh, there's absolutely no FDG uptake. The point is that it's very well known that the majority of prostate uh, cancer will uh, lack uptake of FDG. So the sensitivity is very, very poor and there's almost uh, no application for that. Uh, another tracer that's been around uh, for a uh, long time is fluoride. Uh, fluoride is based on the metabolism of bone, and therefore it has the capability to assess uh, bone lesion, uh, so assess the skeleton, just like bone scintigraphy. Uh, it's uh, much more detailed as compared uh, to bone scintigraphy, but at the same time, uh, it has the problem of the very expensive tool necessary to perform a PET scan. 
So essentially is regarded uh, as a less cost-effective approach as compared to bone scanning. The key limitation is that you can only assess the skeleton while um, especially in biochemical recurrency, you want to have information about the bone, but also uh, about the local recurrency and about the lymph node status. And definitely it cannot be provided by fluoride PET. So um, even if in the US there is still some emphasis uh, and in few European country, there is uh, application. Um, in the majority of Western Europe, uh, it's regarded as a tracer with very limited clinical use. Uh, uh, and again, um, only for bone assessment, so very limited itself. This is a nice image uh, provided by fluoride PET. As you can see, the detail is, uh, is fantastic. It's just like uh, a very, very nice bone scan. Uh, this literature that demonstrated the superiority as compared to bone scan, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the application uh, are very, very limited. Uh, again, due to the fact that the cost is frequently very high and the information are essentially the same that you can get uh, uh, with bone scintigraphy. And the problem is the same, that there is a lack of specificity. So uh, every disease that will modify the metabolism of bone will be seen as a hotspot with that approach. Uh, Colin is another tracer. Colin can be labeled with carbolin 11, can be also labeled with fluoride 18. Um, it, it seems, it sounds as a new tracer, but indeed it has been used since 20 years. So there's a large literature available on this radio pharmaceutical. Uh, it's approved in several countries, not everywhere. Um, it, it's interesting, but we will see which is uh, the limitation. Um, as I mentioned, it's been introduced 20 years ago by Japanese colleagues that have uh, uh, used it uh, since uh, the late uh, last century. Um, that's the same gentleman that I showed you before. So that's the FDG scan here that was completely negative. While the Collins scan can clearly identify um, the hot spot uh, corresponding to the local recurrency of prostate cancer. So uh, Colin has uh, had uh, some success. It has also been incorporated, for example, in the North American guidelines. This is the 2014 guidelines. As you can see, we are talking about biochemical failure or biochemical recurrency. Uh, and among uh, the other methods, uh, which are namely CT, MRI, and uh, bone scintigraphy, is also mentioned the uh, carbon choline PET as a, uh, an imaging method that could be applied. Um, however, my impression, and you can clearly see, which is uh, uh, from the lecture that I gave last year at EAU, um, Colin PET has to be nowadays regarded as an outdated approach. And the answer, of course, is yes, um, it is. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that we run a couple of years ago. So starting with the, a lot of uh, papers that have been published on Colin, and that was in biochemical recurrency. That's definitely uh, the most uh, widely uh, searched application. And uh, the fact is that if you pull together uh, you have a detection rate, uh, which is around 60%. So 60% uh, uh, is not bad, but is uh, much less uh, than we would hope uh, to obtain. And that's the reason why other radio tracers have been uh, studied. And uh, one is FACBC, also known as flucyclovine. Uh, flucyclovine is a synthetic amino acid. Uh, so just like Colin, uh, Colin is a metabolic tracer because it's based on the phospholipid metabolism, uh, while flucyclovine is based on uh, a metabolism of amino acid. Uh, it's used since uh, 10 years. There's a, a growing amount of literature available. Uh, and what's really relevant is that's now been approved in several countries, which makes a difference. Um, it's been introduced about 10 years ago in North America by the group in Emory. Uh, that they first uh, made imaging uh, in human using FACBC. Uh, we ran a comparative trial with Colin and we found out that FACBC, or again flucyclovin, uh, was superior to Colin for identification of uh, the recurrency of uh, prostate cancer. Um, this has led to the approval of the tracer. 
uh, either in the US and in Europe. And again, uh, there's a growing amount of data coming out uh, due to the fact that being approved, it can be used. And indeed, uh, especially in the US, it has to be regarded as the, the standard of reference uh, if you are uh, scanning a patient for uh, biochemical recurrence of prostate cancer. But I guess that everybody is aware that uh, the, the biggest uh, success in nuclear medicine in the last decade has probably been the introduction of PSMA. PSMA is based on a different concept because it's a receptor um, tracer, so it's not a metabolic tracer itself. It can be labeled with gallium-68 or fluoride-18. Uh, it's been introduced at relatively recent. That's the first... Um, uh, images carried out uh, in rodent, and it was something like uh, uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, and that's the first paper that was 2012 from the group in Heidelberg uh, who made uh, uh, human imaging. Uh, and uh, again, the, the number of publications that have been uh, um, reported in the last year is incredible. Uh, if you check uh, this year, there's uh, one original article every day uh, which is something which is quite uncommon in the nuclear medicine area. And I used to mention that there's a sort of flourishing of centers doing uh, gallium PSMA. You can really have it done uh, all around the world from South America, uh, let's say Uruguay, Brazil, uh, Chile, Mexico, and uh, Africa, Singapore. India is very active and of course uh, Europe. Uh, and fortunately in the US uh, there's only a few ongoing clinical trial, and they are quite far from registration, but for example, in Australia, it's routinely used. And there are some interesting tools in order to have uh, applied the, the PSM approach. Uh, so we have guidelines uh, uh, about uh, the technical approach, how to perform the scanning, uh, and there's also efforts uh, in order to develop uh, uh, standardized uh, criteria for reporting. Uh, as I mentioned, it uh, is, is a receptor, is a transmembrane receptor that can be labeled with different ligands. So what we call PSMA PET-CT is indeed a sort of a, a basket which can comprise different uh, radio tracer because the ligand can be slightly modified uh, in order to have uh, some difference. Uh, and a question, an open issue, is that uh, you can read of uh, many different uh, PSMA compounds from fluorinated PSMA 107 to the PSMA 11 uh, and other uh, very, let's say, strange and complex uh, uh, molecules. Uh, it could get even more complex when you are referring to different isotopes like uh, indium-111, technetium, or very unusual isotopes. So probably by a non-nuclear medicine point of view, it's a bit complicated. Uh, in my opinion, there is uh, room for clinical application only for the fluorinated compound and the gallium labeled compound. Uh, and at present, uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to identify who will be the winner. I remember that recently at a meeting, there was my, my friend and, and the famous urologist, our share from Memorial, uh, that said, why, why don't you make your horse race and you let us know which is the best horse? And unfortunately, it won't be possible to tell it in, in the short term. Uh, but uh, the gallium-68 compound uh, definitely have uh, a much bigger amount of available data right now, especially for the so-called PSMA-11, and it's likely to be cheaper. Uh, the fluorinated compound will be very interesting because they will allow distribution, especially important for US and UK market, uh, so in the form of ready-to-inject ready pharmaceutical, but unfortunately, they still need... Uh, uh, time for being uh, uh, registered and commercially available, uh, at least I would say a couple of years to get there. So these are the premises by the, in my opinion, methodological point of view. Let, let's start now to focus on the clinical need. That's to say, um, which are the clinical situation where PET-CT can really make a difference. Uh, theoretically, 
you can use PET-CT for uh, identification of prostate cancer, so primary diagnosis. You can use it for staging, so uh, when at presentation you want to see how is, um, which is the extent of the disease. Uh, I already mentioned it several times, biochemical recurrence, which remains uh, the most important application, and then you can um, possibly apply it to therapy planning. Uh, for diagnosis, I'm referring uh, to something that probably all of you know, uh, which are the EAU guidelines. Uh, and as you can see, there's no mention at all of PET. There's mention of uh, multiparametric MRI, which indeed has a more and more relevant role in this area. Um, but PET is not mentioned. And I guess it's, it's very correct because uh, uh, what we published uh, some years ago is that uh, um, there's uh, absolutely lack of uh, specificity of that was a choline pet at that time because you can see uptake of choline either in the malignant disease but also in benign situation like BPH or a great pin or even in prostatitis. Uh, this data were confirmed by few other publications and uh, I guess that at present nobody is uh, trying to use any more choline for making diagnosis of prostate cancer. Now with the boom that I mentioned of uh, PSMA PET, there's been some preliminary attempt in the last uh, months to use PSMA PET for this purpose, uh, but the data are really, really very preliminary, and I guess that so far we cannot make uh, any conclusion. If not, that again, impression is that uh, uh, the specificity will not be high enough uh, to really provide, uh, uh, let's say, important application. So I guess that we can conclude that at present, uh, for the diagnosis of prostate cancer, uh, PET uh, has no role with uh, any tracer. Uh, let's go to staging. Uh, staging, uh, again, EAU guidelines, uh, uh, it's mentioned uh, uh, multiparametric MRI in the high-risk patients. Uh, it's also uh, mentioned uh, to perform a CT and bone scan, which are the very conventional, widely used, uh, and still applied method with a strong recommendation, but there's no mention for PET. Uh, and again, uh, I reasonably agree with the guidelines. So it's interesting to notice that bone scan is still there and bone scan has been introduced more than 50 years ago. There are few uh, imaging approach that have survived so long and it's uh, interesting. Um, the problem, for example, for Colin, is that the sensitivity at staging is quite low. Uh, you see a couple of uh, paper that report a pullet sensitivity of about 50%, which is, uh, of course, not sufficient uh, for a wide clinical application. So essentially for Colin, we can conclude that the low sensitivity and therefore the many phase negatives uh, led to a almost no clinical role uh, in uh, staging. Um, but this is an area where gallium PSMA has been suggested to have a potential role. This is a first paper about two years ago that suggested that uh, the sensitivity could raise uh, to something like 70%. And that of course could make a difference. Uh, this has been confirmed by several papers published recently. Uh, demonstrating that PSMA PET can have a role, of course, not in every patient, but essentially in high risk patient. It's questionable if the intermediate risk patient may benefit from this. And I'm going to show you a case that has been presented at AU this year by my friend Alberto Briganti. So it's a patient, relatively young, 61 years old. These are the value of a PSA. Uh, transrectal ultrasound uh, was revealing a lesion and it was a gleason 4 plus 4 in several cores. And here is the MRI and it's clearly confirmed a lesion that you can see. And conventional uh, imaging done with bone scintigraphy and uh, CT were negative. So this is a patient with a disease which apparently is confined to the prostate gland. Uh, but as part of a trial that we are running with the colleagues in Milan, we demonstrated the presence of the primary tumor, but also lesion located at the lymph nodes and at bone. Uh, 
lesions that were not seen with other methods. So uh, with this sort of staging, the patients moved from an M0 to M1 situation, which is of course uh, very important by the clinical point of view with many implication on the therapies. Uh, overall, there's been a meta-analysis recently published uh, that reported five original papers uh, that uh, had uh, uh, a wide variety of results. And that was the main reason, the, war the variety of results for not having been incorporated into the EIU guidelines. Uh, nonetheless, there's a growing interest on that, uh, and it's possible that in the next future, with more and more data, uh, available, uh, it's possible that PSMA PET may also be applied for staging high risk patients. Uh, uh, the potential is clearly very good and very high. We have to demonstrate with more robust data uh, that the potential uh, is really correspondent to a major clinical application. Uh, and now recurrence. Um, recurrence is absolutely, without any discussion, the main area of application of PET-CT in the imaging of prostate cancer. Uh, and I hope that this image will provide you the reason why, you know, that's a patient treated with prostatectomy with the first biochemical relapse and then I treated with uh, ADT and uh, then it became uh, resistant. And, you know, PET scanning in this case has been carried out uh, with Colin can tell you the many lesion and with one image only, you can have information about the local recurrency that in this case is not present, the bone spread and the nodal disease. So one exam only that is providing you a perfect restaging of the patient. Uh, again, as I already showed this image, this has led to incorporation in the North American guideline. And this is another example, as you can see, the point is, uh, clinically, uh, you want to treat the patient as soon as possible. So you want to treat the patient when uh, there is uh, an early recurrence, like in this case, PSA is only 1.3, short doubling time, negative bone scintigraphy, and one lymph node only seen by Colin Pat here, correspondent to the uh, site of relapse. And of course, knowing where the relapse has occurred makes a difference uh, for uh, a personalized therapy. Uh, again, another patient with similar story, early recurrency, uh, a lesion here on the bone, and it's the only bone lesion not seen on CT. Bone scintigraphy was negative. And again, I already show you this, uh, this data, 60%, uh, 62% uh, of detection rate, and it's important to mention detection rate because uh, the majority of paper are not reporting with pathology as gold standard. So you cannot honestly talk about uh, uh, sensitivity, but rather on detection rate. 62%, uh, uh, the fact is that um, if you are referring to low PSA values, uh, which is the range where it would be mostly important uh, to um, to diagnose where the recurrency has occurred. Uh, unfortunately, the sensitivity of um, Colin Pet drops down to very low values, uh, which have very low clinical uh, uh, value. So I, I used to say that Colin Pet CT is sort of a glass that you can see as half empty or half full. Uh, and that's been the reason why other tracer, and, and I'm showing in particular PSMA examples, but also fluciclovine and FACBC are very important because being superior to Colin, uh, they have a major clinical impact. That's an example. And again, you can see in one image only, which is the strength of this method, the capability to immediately draw the attention to the lesion that have been recurrent. Uh, and the fact is that the major comparator, like uh, all body MRI, all body MRI, is, it's a, a really beautiful tool, but can essentially provide you only information about the bone. Uh, Multiparametric MRI is exquisite, especially for local recurrency, but all the information in one image only can be provided by PET-CT with different tracer. Uh, these are the data for gallium PSMA, the sensitivity. This is one of the first paper, again, from the group uh, in Heidelberg that out of any discussion has been pioneer uh, in this area, uh, showed uh, a very high uh, sensitivity, around 80%. That's an example from our files. Uh, again, a patient uh, with a PSA very low with a short doubling time and the lesion localized uh, at the bone level. 
This is the largest uh, series published so far, and it's once again German, uh, with sensitivity around 80%. Now this could be questionable because it's more detection rate than sensitivity, but 80% is absolutely much better than Colin. Uh, that's a meta-analysis that's been published uh, a couple of years ago. And you can see here is located uh, the overall uh, um, sensitivity, which is uh, quite good, but especially in the relapse, uh, which is better than 75, around 80%. What is very interesting is that the detection rate is conserved, is reasonably conserved even at low PSA level. So in the range where it's mostly clinical relevant to have information, uh, PSMA PET has uh, a detection rate or a capability around 60 to 65 percent. Uh, that's the reason why EAU has finally incorporated the PSMA PET CT uh, in the guideline. It occurred uh, uh, in March this year. And as you can see, it's suggested that uh, uh, PSMA PET CT or Colin uh, could be carried out, uh, especially if PSA is higher than one. We, we can further discuss this uh, aspect of the threshold. Uh, and I can anticipate to you that in the 2019 guideline, it will be also mentioned uh, fluciclovin. Uh, but it's clear that now there is a strong recommendation for sure after radiotherapy, but also after radical prostatectomy uh, to perform PET-CT in case of biochemical recurrency. So in conclusion, by the clinical point of view, there's for sure uh, a role, an important role uh, of PET imaging in prostate cancer relapse, uh, especially with the new radio tracer now available. The, the final application is therapy planning. Therapy planning meaning uh, in the exactly same scenario that I described, if you can localize um, where the recurrence occurred, uh, you can adapt, for example, uh, the treatment plan with the salvage external beam radiation therapy, uh, which can be adapted by incorporating the lymph nodes eventually interested or by providing a boost in an area known. Uh, so the concept is, is to personalize the treatment with that. Uh, there is ongoing trial on that. Many centers are studying not only to demonstrate that you will change the treatment plan, but it will have an impact on the clinical management. So let, let's come to draw some conclusion and to possibly raise up a couple of questions. Um, I try to show you which are the potential of PET imaging uh, in the prostate cancer application. And um, in my view, uh, there is uh, some application uh, in the staging setting uh, that are likely to be more relevant in the next future when more data will be available, uh, especially in high-risk patients. Uh, biochemical recurrence uh, is for sure the area of most important application of uh, PET-CT, uh, in particular with the new radio tracer. So we have to think about PSMA where available, fluciclovin or colin. Um, and finally, therapy planning uh, is another area where PET is becoming more and more relevant. Uh, I told you there are open issues, which is uh, important to mention and to have in mind. Uh, most studies in the field of uh, diagnostic imaging are based uh, on sensitivity detection rate, uh, uh, which is uh, to demonstrate essentially that you see more. But does it mean that you treat better the patient, that it has an impact on survival. That's what we should aim at that demonstrated. Well, un unfortunately, we don't have those studies for many reasons uh, that we can eventually discuss. It's, it's the fact of some lack of sponsoring, some difficulties to carry out those trials uh, because frequently the clinicians, once they know that the imaging method is available, they want to have it for every patient. <laughs> they don't want to randomize um, and it's, in any case, uh, uh, uneasy to make a prospective multicentric randomized trial on imaging when after the imaging there should be implication in the treatment. So the treatment somewhat becomes more important than the imaging itself. Well, at least we have some studies on the, let's say, impact on clinical decision making that uh, 
we hope that in turn will imply uh, modification in the survival. Uh, there's quite good literature on Colin due to the fact that Colin has been introduced uh, uh, much long before uh, the other tracer. Uh, and now uh, there are good trials coming out for uh, PSMA. For example, that's a, a trial which is now running in Australia. And, and I have to be honest, um, if it's true that Western Europe, and in particular Germany, has been uh, the pioneer for developing uh, um, PSMA and other new tracer, well, Australia is running very well and very fast. And that's a, a nice uh, perspective randomized trial uh, led by Mike Hoffman that will provide uh, very soon information about the real impact on that. So, it was a rush. Uh, I guess that uh, I made it uh, in, in five minutes less, so we have more time for the question. And uh, please feel free to raise question. It should be possible um, to see. Be patient with me. I have to try to see all of them. And uh, I'm reading the question. <laughs> so the question is about uh, now, the point of PSA threshold that has been mentioned in the EAU guidelines, yeah, it's true. Um, the fact is that uh, it, it has been uh, um, described, this concept of uh, PSA threshold uh, with, uh, in biochemical recurrence uh, higher than one uh, because uh, the sensitivity, or again, the detection rate was uh, unacceptably too low. Uh, in in the setting of PSA lower than one. Um, in my opinion, it's not a correct perspective. It's more important uh, to consider also PSA kinetics, which is at least as important, probably even more than PSA values. Uh, and the other fact is that you have to consider all the clinical data of the patient to take your decision. So it, it's not only about uh, the threshold itself, but the implication on the patient management. So let me read. Uh, uh, yeah, follow up. There's a question about uh, uh, if there is a place for PET in the follow up of the patients. Um, well, honestly, I don't think so. Don't forget that uh, uh, any PET scanning is an expensive approach. Um, Follow up, I mean, routine evaluation of patients so far uh, has to be done with um, reliable but cheap tools. So PSA, definitely the measurement of PSA and the clinical evaluation remains uh, the more important. In case of a change, again, CT and bone scanning are very old approach, but remains um, the, the first step to be done. And in case they don't provide uh, the information that you may need, then it could be considered to carry out uh, uh, different approaches that could be either MRI, whole body MRI, or uh, multiparametric MRI, or uh, um, PET CT with different tracer. Uh, oh yeah, again, another question about uh, the value of PSA uh, in biochemical recurrence after prostatectomy. Uh, if there is um, a threshold, uh, again, well, of course, this should be a biochemical recurrence. So PSA should be higher than 0.2 if the patient has been treated with radical prostatectomy. Um, we usually take into um, more account uh, uh, the kinetics. So uh, the doubling time, if the doubling time is shorter than six months, it's clearly um, a relevant parameter to be taken into account uh, to have a gallium PSMA scan carried out or, or whatever tracer. Uh, you know, the same is true for fluciclovine or for Colin. Um, the shorter the doubling time, um, the more likely that you can have useful information for the management of the patient. Let me go through. Uh, well, it's again about the cutoff of PSA. I guess that we are getting... Uh, um, the suggestion is, uh, uh, a, a colleague uh, is asking if uh, we should scan for biochemical recurrence a patient with uh, 0 0.5 PSA or even less. Again, uh, um, especially if the patient has been uh, surgically treated and you plan to make a salvage external beam radiation therapy, this, there are 
robust and uh, uh, very clear data that the sooner you treat the patient, the best is the outcome in terms of um, survival. So um, again, I would favor an approach based on very early scan of the patients given that uh, those parameters are satisfied so this should be a, a biochemical recurrence demonstrate uh, sorry one more question is uh, uh, i cannot clearly understand the, the delay for the pet scan to be in guidelines so maybe it's referred to the fact that uh, um, I mean, every guideline intrinsically should be based on robust data from uh, possibly tertiary literature, that's to say meta-analysis, or uh, um, very strong uh, prospective randomized multicentric trial that unfortunately in the imaging area are not common at all. That's why it took so long to have, uh, uh, for example, fluciclovine, PSMA, and colin PET incorporated into the EAU guideline. But I guess that was a very correct approach. I mean, we cannot incorporate uh, a, a method, whatever method, uh, just because uh, it's anecdotically reported or a couple of papers have demonstrated in monocentric, uh, um, uncontrolled trial uh, that there are good results and success. Uh, usually it takes time, but it's uh, normal, it's science. I mean, science is based on a very robust and scientifically sound data. So um, as I anticipated to you, 2019 guideline will report, uh, uh, will describe the usefulness in biochemical recurrency. And I'm optimist, I guess in a couple of years, probably uh, for the staging could also be mentioned, but what we need is a well-designed trial. Um, well, a, a very interesting question is about uh, the effect of ADT on the sensitivity of PCMA PET. That's a, a very interesting uh, question because um, it's known that the um, expression of receptor is influenced by ADT and it's influenced especially in the short run uh, with an increase of the receptor. This has been demonstrated only in uh, in uh, in vivo, but uh, let's say non-clinical studies, so in uh, animal models. Uh, it may raise up uh, the fact uh, that it's unlikely to evaluate response to therapy uh, if you are using ADT with the PSMA PET. Uh, and in fact, so far there has not been uh, studies on that. But the sensitivity may also be influenced. Uh, in our experience, honestly, um, there's no need to withdraw ADT, especially because if the hormonal therapy is effective, uh, there's no need to scan the patient. Uh, you will scan the patient when it gets uh, castration resistant. So at that point, uh, uh, you may suppose uh, that uh, there's no longer an influence on ADT on the expression of that. Uh, and that's the reason why we don't ask patients to withdraw uh, ongoing ADT. Uh, but it's very, very sure that there's no data sufficient to draw any conclusion at present. Uh, wow, that's a very nice question. <laughs> Uh, I can read it literally. Do you think that in 2018 it will be possible to manage prostate cancer without having a PET scan? Uh, well, the question is interesting. Uh, yes, because I guess that in uh, the majority of patients uh, to identify the cancer and to take the decision, uh, if you are especially considered the, the large amount of patients that are low risk, that can not be submitted to um, to surgery. Uh, well, they don't need, of course, a PET CT scan. Uh, so there are many situations where you don't need a PET scan. But if you're referring to the patients which are uh, going to be treated with um, a radical prostatectomy or a radical uh, radiation therapy, um, then especially if it's high risk patients, it could be considered to have a PET CT scan. But for sure. Uh, in case of biochemical recurrency that everybody knows will uh, occur quite frequently in the clinical story of the patients. Um, I don't think it's now really possible to figure out um, a very 
proper and uh, let's say personalized uh, approach to the patient without having a PET scan carried out uh, with uh, the available tracer. Another question is about uh, staging. So bone scan and CT are recommended in patients, uh, uh, but their sensitivity is quite low, especially for PSA lower than 10. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, should we really stage our patient with bone scanning and CT? Well, that's a very good question. I, uh, me and, and my friend Anwar Padani from London, who is a great friend doing MRI, a great expert of that. We frequently raise this question uh, because there's no doubt that uh, a whole body MRI, multi-parametric MRI and PET-CT can provide more uh, accurate information than bone scanning and CT. Uh, at the same time, the approach uh, could be quite expensive and there's no demonstration of uh, such um, cost effectiveness of modern imaging. Um, it's true that patients with PSA lower than 10 have a very minimal likelihood of positive bone scanning, if I remember well, it's less than 3%. And CT, um, it's unlikely that can provide information about node, uh, if the node are not a really a lump or um, a bone, uh, if not really at very advanced stage. So uh, by the concept or by the, let's say the principle, it, it's clear that it's tempting to substitute bone scanning and CT with MRI and PET. Uh, at the same time, uh, those methods are uh, very well established, very well known. Uh, whoops, sorry, I went to this. Uh, let me come back, sorry, Gay. Um, and in most of uh, um, the center, CT and bone scans will be available very rapidly. And as a first step, I guess it still makes sense to have those uh, carried out. Uh, probably in the next future we will move, but again, we don't have at present enough data about that. Uh, another question, which is the half-life of the tracer? Well, the half-life depends, of course, on the half-life of the isotope, which could be if it's fluoride is six hour, gallium, it's much shorter, choline is very, very short. <laughs> so uh, for choline, you need a cyclotron and there's very few centers that are doing uh, carbon-11 choline. Uh, the fluorinated being six hours, the half-life can be distributed. That's the key advantage of fluorinated compound, including flucyclovine or a fluorinated PSMA, because you can have a central radiopharmacy which uh, uh, sell it and send it to the peripheral. Uh, it, it's very tempting, uh, a very good concept if you don't uh, have a cyclotron on site, which is indeed the reality of the great majority of centers. Uh, is there, so the question is, a special requirement to be able to give it in a nuclear medicine department? Uh, this is quite a tricky question because the, the law is very different country by country. Even in Western Europe, uh, the legislation is still country-based. So there may be authorization, which are necessary to handle the different isotopes, um, the, which is quite true in every country. Uh, then uh, there could be authorization for the individual radiopharmaceutical. Uh, for commercial purpose, the situation is much simpler um, because we have agency, namely FDA uh, in the US uh, and EMA in Europe. Uh, every country essentially has its own um, um, agency uh, that is uh, authorizing. And as I mentioned, uh, it, it's very important, for example, that uh, flucyclovine uh, as a commercial license in Europe and in the US, because that makes it uh, easily commercially available uh, all around. So you can go, you purchase, uh, there is a, a, a license, an authorization, uh, which makes life much easier. Because if you want to use, uh, for example, gallium PSMA, uh, in Spain, as far as I know, it's almost impossible because a regulatory agency is forbidden it. In, in several other countries, is done only within clinical trials, just like in the US or in Italy. Uh, in other, is based on individual responsibility of uh, the nuclear medicine physician, like in Germany. So the situation is really um, very different country by country. Uh, another question, again, is about... Uh, lowest level of PSA for PET to catch recurrency. Um, 
There's no lower level. I, I've seen studies carried out in, in Australia with um, a level of PSA which are below the definition of biochemical recurrency. So, for example, if you've been radically treated and then your PSA drops to zero, um, and then there is a little increase, uh, something point, uh, let's say, zero 0.5, and then gets to point 0.1, cannot in a couple of months cannot be described as biochemical recurrence but nonetheless in some cases they have been scanned with positive findings and they have been treated it has been demonstrated to be a real finding so a true positive finding and it has an impact on the patient management uh, of course we still don't know if uh, it has a positive impact on uh, overall survival simply because we haven't run appropriate trials on that. Uh, but the logic, the rational is clearly in favor of that, there's no doubt. Uh, another question again on PSA, I don't want to go. <laughs> Any use of PET in assessing the response to ADT? Um, no, I guess there is a tracer that I haven't been covered, sorry about that. Uh, so there are tracer which can uh, demonstrate the presence uh, of uh, uh, the hormonal receptor. Uh, it has been pioneered uh, in, um, in North America, in uh, New York, for example, at Memorial, they have been studying. So there are tracers specifically targeting uh, the presence of receptor. So they can theoretically predict the response to ADT, uh, but they haven't gained uh, uh, widespread clinical use. They're very, very experimental. That's the reason why I haven't mentioned it. As I told you, there are ongoing trial. Well, honestly, this has been especially studied something like 10 years ago. Um, but there are ongoing trials, for example, on bomb basing receptors. So there's a lot of activity in, in other new tracers. Uh, at present, there is no um, clinical role for a PET tracer to assess the response to ADT. You should get uh, uh, clinical information, lab information for that. Uh, I don't think that even MRI or other imaging approach can be, let's say, uh, clinically relevant used for that. Another question is about uh, PET MRI with the uh, any tracer for diagnosing prostate cancer and its clinical value? Uh, it's a very good question. The point about PET MRI is that uh, is a, a super expensive approach uh, because the tomograph is very expensive and complex. So the procedure is very long and complex. Um, and then the centers having this tomograph available um, cannot perform uh, a relevant number of scans. Uh, so if you are considering clinical value as something really clinical on a daily routine basis, I don't think that we can call PET-MR as uh, such uh, uh, an approach right now. Uh, there are many interesting papers uh, suggesting that probably if you take the best of the two methods, that's to say multiparametric MRI together with a very sensitive uh, PET tracer, you can probably uh, get them together and having the best uh, tool for diagnosing prostate cancer. It's out of any discussion that it's also the most expensive tool. Uh, in my view, demonstrating any cost effectiveness for that, it's quite unlikely. Uh, probably in some very selected situation in very selected centers, uh, let's say academic research centers, uh, it could be done. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, the most advanced aspect of um, imaging, modern imaging right now. Uh, another question is about SPECT. Well, SPECT has been used, uh, especially with technetium PSMA either in Germany, and I guess there is ongoing trial in the US. Uh, SPECT is not as popular as PET, uh, partly due to a little lower uh, resolution capability. Um, it's been used especially when you cannot have access to PET. So it could be interesting because technetium labeling is available everywhere, usually cheap, can allow uh, local simple labeling, no cyclotron need. Uh, 
but clinically at present uh, there's no much emphasis on that uh, even if technically is uh, possible and uh, again there are a couple of um, um, technetium psma available so a question is about uh, um, why is psma useful in recurrence and not useful in stage of a disease um, the question is different, I'm sorry, maybe I haven't been clear. Uh, the rationale is possibly the same to early evaluate, for example, and identify lymph nodes or bone which are interested by prostate cancer. Uh, the literature available for um, biochemical recurrency is uh, much more robust and uh, um, the data are, let's say, 10 times more um, relevant as compared to staging uh, because we started studying biochemical recurrency so we build up uh, a literature which is strong enough now to allow incorporation into guidelines for staging we are still doing that we are still building out the evidence so we probably will need more time to assess it uh, there's another little problem is about sensitivity to identify micrometastasis at lymph node level um, at staging, it's very important, especially in the high risk, to see the lymph node which are interested. And in some cases, uh, it goes below the spatial residual capability of PET, which is around four to five millimeters. So we need time. I'm optimistic <laughs> we'll get there, hopefully. Uh, another question is the bone supporting therapy, just like uh, Zolendronate or Denuzumab, uh, give false positive on bone evaluation of bone mat? Uh, no. As far as I know, I have no experience of a false positive. Uh, there could be other reason for a false positive at the bone. Well, of course, depending on the tracer you are using. If you are using, for example, fluoride, just like for bone scanning, um, a fracture is a cause of false positive, but even, uh, um, let's say, an, an arthrotic process uh, is a reason for that. Uh, we have seen something like that also for PSMA. So a, a recent uh, relevant inflammatory event could lead to false positive finding. Uh, but are false positive findings that indeed can be solved quite easily because uh, uh, if you just have one uh, single bone lesion at the rib, um, you will be, let's say, cautious before calling that as a mat. You can simply ask the patient if he has recently uh, rib trauma or something like that. Uh, so the question is, uh, should nuclear medicine know if the therapy has been initiated? Again, uh, we ask carefully uh, which is the ongoing therapy, uh, but I have no particular worries about the fact that any neither supplementation nor bone targeted therapy started recently. Uh, well, there's a question about uh, tracer that can be used therapeutically as well. Uh, for example, capping the tracer uh, with the radioactive emitter. Yes, definitely. Absolutely, yes. It's one of the most uh, exciting and promising area of nuclear medicine. Uh, if you replace the, um, the positron emitter, so if you replace gallium, if you replace fluoride uh, with lutetium, uh, which is uh, uh, an isotope that can deliver energy in order to kill the cell that are being labeled, uh, you will have the concept of teranostic that you see you treat what you see hot in the diagnostic area. The concept is very simple. It's already applied, for example, for lutetium PSMA. So you scan the patient with gallium PSMA, uh, and then you administer lutetium PSMA. Um, there are uh, ongoing trial on that. Uh, in my view, there's a bright future for this. So we should uh, again wait for phase three trials, which are already ongoing uh, and I can again mention the colleagues uh, uh, in Australia so again is Mike Hoffman which is leading uh, a nice multicentric trial that is expected to be soon data on that uh, um, it's uh, definitely the the future so as nuclear medicine physician we can be very excited that we will have chance not only to make diagnosis but also uh, to make therapy in the next future
Uh, another question. Thanks indeed for the many questions. I'm very happy <laughs> I raised up. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I have to be happy for the many questions or if I have, it's a proof that I've been unclear, sorry in case. <laughs> uh, yep, uh, this is quite similar. It's possible to imagine a role for therapy in the treatment of prostate carcinoma, combining pharmaceutical uh, agents uh, with uh, Radio pharmaceutical, yes, of course. Once that you have demonstrated uh, that, uh, again, for example, lutetium PSMA is working, you can uh, then uh, imagine uh, combinatory trials, but uh, uh, it, it's clear we first need to demonstrate with a good trial that lutetium PSMA or actinium, because it's also alpha therapy, you know, actinium PSMA is another uh, very brilliant uh, um, isotope for therapy. Uh, well, another question about staging. Uh, what's my opinion for uh, PET, PSMA PET CT in the preoperative setting to find positive nodes? Uh, uh, it, it's absolutely what we are uh, trying to study right now. Uh, I showed you the example of the case of the ongoing trial that we, but there are many ongoing trials uh, all around the world on that. Uh, the concept is a high risk patient to see uh, the nodal spread and uh, base uh, the dissection of the lymph node on the PET finding. And that will be quite simple even to have the, um, the gold standard because you have the pathological data. So in this case, uh, we can really talk about sensitivity and specificity. Just a matter of time that uh, the trial could be concluded. Uh, another question, medical uh, contraindication to PET-CT. No, as far as I know, um, there's no possibility to have uh, a relevant side effect. The amount of drug which is administered uh, is very more than unlikely to determine uh, any allergic reaction uh, of uh, any situation with that. There's no therapeutic effect. So I'm not aware of um, medical contraindication. Uh, usually for um, nuclear medicine exam like PCT, we mention uh, the pregnancy, but it's clear that is not a problem here. So I guess that we are almost at the end of uh, our time. As far as I see, there's no more question. Uh, again, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, before ending, I'd like to remind uh, to all of you that there will be a training course uh, on prostate PET uh, at the next uh, ESU meeting in November. And uh, in particular, I will be there and I will have the pleasure to help this course. Uh, and uh, uh, there are other webinars to come. So the next uh, URO webinar is there, is the 13th of November. Um, well, many thanks and uh, have a good night. Thank you very much.